your work, where have we come from? Um, I hope we'll get to some of that, but I want to start with a different angle. And, um, and it's this. Uh, I, I think that the proper question the artist asked to the revered elder is not what happened, but where we are now. That's the question that I'm interested in asking right now. And so, President Barack Obama and Eric Gardner, Ferguson and Winnipeg, Black People Matter and Idle No More, Reconciliation and Tina Fontaine. Can you tell us where are we now in the representation and writing of race? You want to go first, David? Okay, first of all, he said reconciliation, didn't he? Oh, my lad. There's no reconciliation for my people. I don't know about yours. Uh, what's being touted as reconciliation is voyeurism by the state looking at what they did to us at residential school. Reconciliation in South Africa was white South Africans admitting what they did to people and those people deciding whether they should be forgiven and or, or charged. That did not happen here. So there's no reconciliation. It was a genocidal project, and the response to it was just a genocidal. That's one of the things I want to say. Thank you. How does that affect writing? Well, I think we've got two women up here, and I have to say this. I've been saying it all, all year. I'm going to keep on saying it. Probably till I die, but 70% of the book buyers are women, and 80% of the books sold are men. And look at the women in this group here. And if you go home and count the books in your library, there are male books and female books. You'll find one way out of balance. And it's the same with the words. <clears throat> Someone said to me, oh, God, that's so beautiful. That's just like uh, Michael and Dodge's Anil's Ghost. And that's the day, except it was written 10 years earlier. And that was Raven's song. I don't get awards in Canada. I get long listed for things, but I don't get awards in Canada. I have gotten awards in the United States because it doesn't hurt them, I suppose. Um, they're colonizing them, other people there. Oh, yeah, they're native to a oh, well, different group. And uh, in this country, uh, Aboriginal women really struggle. You know, no one knows. Marilyn Dumont knows. Um, Louise Half knows. Joanna Mount knows. And so on and so forth. We, we struggle very, very, very hard. And we're not a well liked group of people. We're not even considered that all that important. So I don't know if it's race so much as uh, sex. This is what really got us all hunkered down. Larissa Lai, all of these great Asian women writers and black women writers, um, always taking a back seat to some guy. And uh, I think we, we need to take a look at that. Um, particularly in the light of how much they like to kill our Asian women in this country. You know, just what would stop them from killing us. Well, honoring us as president. As president. Simple as that. Uh, reading us would help. Well, David, um, I, I don't think I can remember the question. <laughs> and I don't think I... I <laughs> <laughs> I just told David before that they gave him the lemonade when he went into his, uh, you know, question. So, the way they're worried about it. <laughs> so, um, I think um, we have a major problem um, in the entire system, if we're talking about uh, like just talk about the education system, because we don't teach about the roots of the question. And um, because of that, everything else comes up, and there's no connection to what really is causing this. So there's no specific 
systemic way of uh, people understanding what they are experiencing um, in the present time. And I'm talking about people with privilege mostly. So, um, and that goes throughout the whole system. You know. um, I think what we have seen is uh, what I call a very slow evolution, not the revolution that we hoped for. And I still can't figure out why is it that we still have to be fighting for every single little um, that, that we are entitled to, or that's just right, or that uh, could be happening including um, just basic things of, uh, you know, addressing and redressing um, historical uh, um, racial divides, um, of um, making sure that all the voices are at the table in some way. Um, I work uh, mainly in dub and the spoken word, and I have to say that um, I am very pleased about that and very happy that uh, the internet um, has come along to sidestep. We, we were already sidestepping the arbitrators of culture who were deciding um, what was fit to be read. Um, we had developed our own audience, um, but now there's this worldwide movement where people are writing and reading more than any other time, um, proportionally, um, and are creating community. It's a, a situation where writing is not equated with a book. So in any writing situation, you go to these people talk about poetry or story, they immediately go to a book. That's the violation of it. We um, have always realized that the book is um, here for a moment, really. And um, that it's about communication. It's about expression, it's about communication, it's about telling stories, it's about the uh, art meeting this aesthetic need that is as necessary as water and air. So that by any means necessary, we say, and when we have been set out of uh, the publishing industry, um, then we take whatever means. Plus, uh, we've had a tradition of uh, reaching people through oratory and through uh, various uh, ways of Ritual in community. So, just the whole idea, uh, if we get back to publishing, of what publishing is, literature is, and book is, um, it's very problematic. Um, and I think that we do have an opportunity here in Canada to change that around as we are uh, creating, um, you know, the, the kind of who we are as we are creating uh, you know, different cultures and so forth. But just to go back again, if we don't get back to the root of the question, I don't see how we can fix anything systemically that will stay fixed. Thank you. Say that you're opt optimistic about the terms under which people come to voice today, the emerging technologies that um, Lillian has uh, just uh, just mentioned, the ability to perhaps sidestep the barriers that um, existed in the past, or is it a different game, um, um, but the same game in, in, a, in, a, in another way? I'm not really sure of the question, but I'm going to reframe it so I can be sure of those things. <laughs> um, I think, on the one hand, the barriers are still there, but I think, on the other hand, there, are, there always has been, um, like, a, a slight of geese, you know, a wedge of uh, warriors pushing through the barriers, and that the numbers are greater now than they were when I was young. Um, I was invited to, in Montreal to the launch of the spoken word artists, and I remember going there and asking why I was invited. And uh, they said, well, you were a spoken word artist in the 80s, 
and, and that's true, but I didn't ever do, you know, any hip hop or anything like that. Okay, for all this. Dan George type. Dan George was actually the first spoken word artist in the country. With the, uh, he was told he couldn't speak at Canada's birthday on the thing. So he had my uh, aunts and my uncle and my dad sing back up. And he recited a poem, <laughs> which is now famous. You can find it on the web. But what we were watching then was Grandpa's Radical. And it was a permission, not just in my hometown, but Maria Campbell was in Edmonton, and George Smith was in uh, Winnipeg, and um, uh, George Rasmus was in the Northwest Territories, and so on. All across the country, these young people uh, started activist movements, the Red Power Movement, the, this, that, and the other thing. And the poetry, it was part of it. It was part of our language. Uh, in, in our language, everything is poetry. So that when we speak English, like I'm speaking to you, I'm actually retranslating twice, once from my language to this poetry, and then to regular, what I call utilitarian English, which we don't have. We don't have past that, would you? Isn't that great? I was kidding. <laughs> and the reason we don't have that is we banned slavery at a certain point in our history. So, if you can reach it yourself, it's you trying to make him a slave for you. You know what I'm saying? And if you can't reach it yourself, someone should notice that you need that and are too small to get it. Or you have no hands, but, you know, whatever the case is. So, on the one hand, we serve those less able, and on the other hand, we make those more able do for yourself. So we have this terrific sense of very fierce self-reliance. There is a barrier, you need to move it not complain that the barrier is there. And of course, that, um, let's just keep the idea that I'm this very fierce person. I suppose I am. I will tell you this story, and that's all I'm going to say about it. I was two and a half, and I was given a jade cloth with spikes on it, not very big, and a piece of rope. And my grandfather paddled out and started to come back in. And I was to sing out to him, I come into the world with a club and a fish wheel. What's your pleasure? And just for the women. <laughs> I want to take up then that, that idea of uh, translation. Um, and um, so translating across uh, languages, uh, across cultures. Um, uh, and I want to ask a guess about what is possible in certain coalitions in which perhaps uh, there is less of a need to translate. There's always perhaps a need to translate. But um, if I were to kind of, um, just speaking personally, what um, a certain um, dialogue um, might create among uh, people of color um, would be that effort that we need not to then um, translate and um, speak, do the pedagogical work of speaking about race, but then get to the issue faster. Now, it wouldn't be automatically simple. Um, there would be lots of differences in the ways we look at this matter. We may not even look at this matter primarily, but I wouldn't have to do a certain type of translation work. Um, is that fair? Is that one of the? Uh, is there? Is that one of the potential in um, in coalitions uh, among people of color? Um, in the same way that uh, working together. Um, as you mentioned, um, as women, uh, there's another uh, opportunity not to have to translate certain struggles. Um, yeah, 
I think uh, when people of color get together, there's a different responsiveness and a responsibility between us than when we're out in the, the world out there. The world out there expects us to put on a daisy apron and explain things to them. And um, we don't have to do that when we're sitting around with Lillian and with Roy and, and others. So we know that when we don't know, it is our responsibility to find out and not expect the other to be uh, my personal in-house block expert or whatever it is that who we're sitting with. Um, I, I just recently did a blurb on the back of an Asian woman's book and I had to read all kinds of things um, to understand her poetry um, that I didn't know anything about. What a journey. And, you know, someone said, well, they just, we just want, like, a paragraph, the, the person who's the publisher. And she, she was not uh, Asian herself. She was white. And I suppose that shabbiness is okay for her, but it was not okay to me, for this friend of mine who took herself all through uh, Asia and the Philippines to North America and into my world and bothered to learn something about my world. So I'm bothering to learn about hers. I did get the blurb done on time. Um, but it affected me and I started to realize that part of the problem that we're always dealing with is we are still explaining ourselves after half a millennial being here. And nothing is explained to us. We were talking about it the other day. You know, why do we have to explain the fucking medicine wheel over and over again? Look on the web, this woman says. 
and they don't explain economic determinism to us because we have to read it. <laughs> oh, look on the map! <laughs> you know, the expectations are different. The, and, and so we live in this constant frame of um, serving. And then it's a relief to get together with, you know, people of color or other Native people and not have to say, to know that if I don't know something that someone's talking about, I will look it up later. I don't need to know it right now. I don't need them to serve me right now. I just need to engage and uh, be at peace and at, at one with these people here um, to, en- to enjoy the emotion, uh, emotional being that's so easy when the emotional being in Canada is so difficult most of the time. I was given a talk the other night with the last little bug of the I won't say no, but there was about 50 uh, Europeans, and every one of them wanted to tell me what was good for me. And I, I kept saying to them, you really aren't going to tell me what's good for me, are you? To each and every one of them, they had to have the attention of me saying, no, I'm not listening to you telling me what's good for me. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, all the punished uh, things that were there were, yeah, what <laughs> you tell them. But I think we, we need to think about that, about this overblown sense of entitlement of Europeans and the absence of entitlement of, for us, you know, and then creating the condition everywhere we go where that's what we have to deal with, and then calling me fierce about resisting that. It's me that's fierce, not that colonization is fierce and ferocious and overwhelming and persistent and nagging and badgering and you know, all kinds of other things that I can think of. But we're the first ones. Um, maybe the other side of... Uh, of uh, that question, then um, I'm just thinking of the. Uh, so, if uh, if there are uh, certain types of uh, unguaranteed opportunities um, when we write among uh, to and uh, have dialogues uh, among pe- other people of color, there's this this notion of the this invoke the Canadian literary establishment. And so it's institutions, it's ways of conferring recognition and awards upon certain writers, withholding that from others. Um, the business models um, uh, that, uh, that under, under, uh, underwrite um, a lot of the cultural and artwork that is done in this country. Um, I can't help but feel that there is a difficult relationship that we are plunged into as artists regarding uh, this Canadian literary establishment. Both of you, I can't help but notice, uh, mentioned very clearly that terms under which that's not of interest to me. I, I receive recognition in other places. My center of being is not there. Um, at the very same time, um, is some sort of confrontation with that establishment inevitable? Is it more important now or less? Or what is, where do, where do you see your work now in relation to that, that thing that I've been working? Different than the establishment they do. Mm-hmm. You know what reminds me this that the Tom King did this great book called uh, The Inconvenient Indian. And he was up for the Western Award or something like that. And 45% of Canadians wanted him to win, thought he should win. And of course, he didn't. Now, let me tell you what the guy that did win, they did a reading of each part. And this is the thing that I remember. And it was a black woman they had reading this, this uh, selection. And this is what she started with. She was given it, she didn't have a choice. Um, she was a poem artist. She was a great reader, by the way. Imagine, I went to Afghanistan 
thinking I was going on a mission to help people. Imagine my surprise when I found out I was there to colonize brown people. And I wanted to shout out, should have read Tom's book. <laughs> you would have known where you came from. <laughs> Imagine his surprise. I can't believe that we're still giving awards to people like this. Well, that's the winner. You know, that was the winner. And then we hear Tom King's uh, reader, which happened to be my son. And uh, they told him he was going to, he's a performing artist, he was going to be performing Tom King's work. So he brings costumes and what, and what, you know, he comes there already to do this acting thing. And, oh, no, 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 you're just going to stand there in your nice shirt and tie and uh, read. But he was off book. <laughs> he's, he's an actor. You know, so he had memorized the whole thing they were supposed to do. So he starts off, there I was, kicking around San Francisco. <laughs> wearing my red hat bandana and going on like this. And uh, people were just turning themselves off in totally different, uh, totally different tone. He was talking about how he was Hollywood, a Hollywood Indian in his young years because he was so disconnected from his community and, and the fracturing of others in the communities as a result of the colonial process has been like that. So that we are not even who we were originally. And that some of our kids are confused about what it is to be indigenous on this continent and how horrific that is for us. And the only way through it is to laugh, it, laugh about it. But the last way is one of those kind of laughs where you cry kind of and I think it's that way for a lot of people of um, color in this country. We are expected to become like the people who established the, their privilege in the first place. Um, that's what the expectation is. I think it's so brilliant about that um, statement um, on the example of how creative labor and uh, genius is conscripted into um, um, an, an attitude and even emotions like imagine my surprise. Um, you know, that's not your in, that's not your feeling. I, I doubt very much that's your that's your feeling, but one um, and it is. Uh, it is also genius um, and a skill uh, and um, there's something I think about myself. Yeah, well, um, thank you, Lee, for that. Um, I, I, I do hold my Canadian uh, friends accountable um, for what they can do with the privilege. And uh, that's one of the conditions of uh, the continuance in terms of being my friend and having the privilege to sit at my kitchen table or my great company. Um, <laughs> so, what I would say, um, just going back to one of my points here, is um, that we are still. And a few lines from the piece talks about um, when passion sings the spirit, which is writing to me. It's liberation. It's liberation is ritual and art, meaning a message to free ourselves from the address, address of the imperial pain. Like I would free up myself from European song, the rubble of reggae resistance of voice and jazz, sublime circuitry, and the African drum, 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 drum. So my intention is that we free up ourselves, mm -hmm. like our dub poetry free up itself from um, academic poetry and mainstream poetry, like our reggae free up itself from Euro classical music. Um, it's been a 
so that's my mission, really, is that um, that ad and dress and address of the imperial forces is that um, if there is no confrontation, there can be confrontation, and we need to do that too. But there is a way that we can free up ourselves from that. And um, I think it's important. In terms of the whole publishing thing, which is Language dance is motion, meaning, meaning, the word dimension, feeling, feeling, sound and sight, images of sound, sound, language in our skin, like the blanket we live in, or talk or bark like the bear barber, the bear bar tree grows so righteously, tongue and pen dance poetic, romance in the idea of word song, word song. Passion sings, spirit, liberation as ritual and art, meaning a message, free up ourselves from the address of the imperial pen, like always free up ourselves from European song, song, the rabble reggae resistance of voice, uh, just, 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 the sublime circuitry, and the African drum, 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 at home, and tongues, moist of words, stories assembled, actions, poetic, poetry as conversation, dialogic, we revel in specificity, cultural, West Indianism in the blue, becoming Caribbean, Africa rebranded in the new, symbol solution, code referencing, whose sound shall chant a new vision. Using the everydayness of voice talk, scope and stylized our beating heart, finding language forms and art to attack, reading words the light against the politics of alienation, bringing inclusion to all things we love as humans. And it goes on. I mean, it ends. Um, then it goes back. It begins with a heartbeat. The dust, the dust. But then it goes back, it goes back, it goes back to the sound that no one hears. But then it goes back to the mother of all sound, leaving behind just the dark. Indian women Oscars for dripping hot in English and dripping like Vogue magazine. We remember to ask her stuff from English, too. Thank you. Thank you. So, oh, sorry, I forgot that I'm supposed to be speaking into this thing. <laughs> um, I want to I wanna, uh, offer the audience some uh, time to ask questions. Uh, that I believe one of the strengths of this uh, gathering is uh, this opportunity for dialogue. I just want to ask one more question, though. I fear it's a selfish question, uh, but um, I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, if you were to give, I don't know, this is the thing, you, you offer examples, Chinese examples, of uh, the artist in its own, and her authenticity. If you were to offer advice to the artists of today, um, advice in general, but perhaps also uh, advice as to uh, the terms of creative practice now for newer uh, artists. What advice would that be? I, I have no real advice for a young artist who are adults. I think the young artist is too. Um, I was two, as a two-year-old, um, I was called upon to hear a story and tell it that different but the same. 
and um, I, I was engaged in that way almost till I was quiet. And then it, after that, it too late. If you're not immensely, endlessly creative by then, you're, you're never going to be. But I, that's how I, old people engaged us in understanding our story, first of all, and in being creative, because the word for art and creativity is the word for our way of life. I don't know if you noticed, but uh, before we had standard clothing like this, we made everything, and it was an art piece, everything. Even the neighbors we sewed with were called. The anthropologists used to tell on us when we were pot latching so they could steal every bone, spoon, knife, ad, piece ball, and sell it and get their millions. They became multi millionaires from it. And we starved because we had nothing to catch another fish with because everything was a piece of art. Everything. And it's how I was raised. Uh, I'm not just an artist with words, though I prefer to play with them more than any of the other art forms that I engage. My life is, is full of art. My children wear leggings that our people have been wearing for thousands of years, and they're art pieces. The socks I make them are art pieces. The socks I make myself are art pieces. Um, the hats and the scarves I make for myself are art pieces. Everything is about art. So if you're not endlessly creative, you can't be thoughtless. You can't be one of my people. And it begins when you're two. It begins when we teach our children to speak when they're six months old. I've got my grandkids and my kids on tape. Speaking two languages at six months old. You wait for your kids to learn to speak. I've, I've seen it. You don't engage those babies in conversation at all. They wait until they say mama or papa or some such. We don't even know if that child understands that mama isn't your name. <laughs> And then they find out that they start calling other people Mama. Like a name. Yeah. No, we're created from the very, very beginning of our lives. So, if you're already 17, I think you're undoing some of the, the depth to your creativity that's been visited upon you because that's what I experienced in school. The death. Every day, my creativity suffered and endured torment and punishment. Every day it's fear. This education that you, you value so much that you spread it around the world is a killer of creativity and human soul. Standard education. It's a military process that kills your creativity so that when you get out of school, you have to undo the damage. And so, I don't know what to say to young people who want to engage their fears. I don't know. Thank you. You know, first of all, do it for self. Make it um, part of who you are. And then um, connect to community connect to um, people who are out there. Use it as a way to build community, to bring the kind of people you need in your life to you. Um, in terms of um, a vocation and how you're going to make a living out of it, I mean, that's a different story. I have one simple thing, and it's by property. Um, <laughs> I, uh, that, that's the, the basic thing. So, and I'm just playing this to tell you that, you know, I've written 
both tapes, etc. I keep, but there is nothing that gives me more joy than in the morning turning this on and in my house. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why, yeah, 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 yeah. Buddha, I just be there with my soul and my spirit. Everything drops off, and I'm in the best mood for the day. There is no money that can pay for that. Okay, so that's what I say. First thing, make God your sacred, personal thing that you guard and protect. For those of us who have, you know, any kind of situation or problems, you know, mental health problems, whatever, you know, anxiety, depression, whatever, a lot of artists go to their art for that. I recommend to my students that they take up a practice. That is a counter to some of the absurdity um, and the inequalities and the things that are out there and threaten themselves. And then find a way to make their work become important to who they care about, the communities they care about, um, in the world that they, 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 they care about. So um, that would be my advice. If you want to get better at it, just learn your craft. Keep practicing. It's really important to get good at it because I'll just turn it on. That's Peter Tuss talking about, everybody talking about peace. But there will be no peace where there's equal rights and just peace, 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 peace. And it just came up randomly. And that's a very important thing to try to realize. That it's, it's about justice. Um, so that's what I say. Learn your craft. Be fierce about it. You know, learn it in a way that you, when you're in by yourself, you're like, I know that same thing. I nail and you do your happy dance, right? It has nothing to do with anybody else or the applause you don't get or get. There is something deeply, fundamentally fulfilling and transformative about being an artist. And if you miss that, it doesn't matter how much money you make or whatever you do or, you know, as long as it's full professor or how big your pay is. If you miss out on that singular joy, I think that you would have your time in your life very well. That's a chance for uh, questions. Uh, so, um, the audience, I could, I could run out there with the mic if, you're, if you're, uh, your voice isn't that loud. I'll just come down. Oh, is there another one? We don't know. Oh, okay. Okay. And as you were speaking, I was thinking about a current event uh, that I came into contact with yesterday. And I just want to give you a bit of context. But it's about uh, a decision that came down through Old City Hall Court yesterday uh, about somebody named Jesse Armitage. And I, I don't know if you've been following it, but basically Jesse Armitage was accused of a number of times, and he uh, went to something called Gladue Court in the Old City Hall in Toronto, which is a court that is set aside to be uh, more attentive to issues uh, pertaining to people of Aboriginal ancestry. And the judge, Tom Nakatsuru, Mr. Justice Tom <laughs> uh wrote a decision to Jesse Armitage. Uh, he, and he noted in his decision, you know, most decisions are written for other lawyers, for people in the judicial community, but I want to write to you. And he wrote this very beautiful decision outlining uh, the histories of colonization, uh, connecting the fact that Mr. Armitage uh, has uh, his gra- that his grandmother was a residential school survivor, and so on. And and Sean wrote this. I say, sorry, I say Sean. Sean is a friend. <laughs> and Sean wrote this decision that, that was very powerful, uh, and and that included Jesse Armitage's life story uh, in, in, in substantial detail. And Sean himself is uh, uh, the son of, a, of an internment survivor, Japanese internment survivor. So there's a lot of intersections happening here. And one of the debates that I've been struggling with is how Jesse Armitage's story has traveled in this decision. Uh, I don't know if Jesse Armitage asked for his story to be told like this, but now everybody's reading this story. And in some ways that's wonderful because now we have, you know, it's a powerful reminder of the legacy of colonialism 
and, and legislative discrimination. On the other hand, you know, this is the story. So I'm asking, so I, well, part of what I'm asking is about how you think about, or how, what, what you would say about the use of life stories in relation to issues of justice. To get him to wherever he was. I appreciate that. But there are a lot of things that brought him there that have nothing to do with what Canada did. Yeah. Other questions? Where that's coming from? I. Just in terms of my work, if you're not familiar with it, um, I am uh, on apologetic mother center um, because I think it's the hardest and most important work um, that can be done by a human plant or animal. Um, so, um, in Instead of uh, going into that point itself is, is one line, I would like to do another point for you, which is the mother of all poems. This little girl may call Anta. This little girl may call Anta. This little girl may call Anta. Ah, 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 ah. My pregnant in my belly and my head full of jelly and my vomit and my sleep and my eat and my sleep and my sigh. La, jalo no, jalo no, jalo no. Me never know say it's a rough, me never know say it's a tough. And this little girl, she wouldn't come the minute before she ready the barn and the months then passed and my out view. Last, 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 last. And the months then passed, and the old you last, 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 last. But this little girl, she wouldn't come the minute before she ready the barn. I'm a labor, 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 I'm a boy. Why? And it hurt, you see, and it dread, you see. But this little girl, she wouldn't come. A minute before she ready the barn and the labor and the labor and the labor and the labor the labor and the labor and the labor and the labor and the push and the push and the push and push and push and push and push and the push and but she burn and it nice to see and she's sweet you see this little girl may call Anta this little girl may call Anta. This little girl may call Anta. Mother said, birth. Revolution. Revolution. For people of color now compared to 20 years ago. Where, where are we compared to 20 years ago? Very hard question to answer. For sure, there's a lot more reading material for me to study. <laughs> that's, that's better. <laughs> my, my bookshelf isn't so white bread anymore. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I think of better as a richer cultural life. Um, for sure, uh, my folks have a richer cultural life because we're not banned from singing and dancing and those kinds of things anymore. And that's in my lifetime. Um, we are able to participate in writing and going to university, which is a gain in my lifetime. I'm not under the Department of Immigration, which is a gain in my lifetime. Um, I'm actually a citizen now. Um, all of this has happened in my lifetime. so. Those things are important, but also I'm the first generation in my family that doesn't have dead children. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> you know, I'd say it's one of those um, sort of uh, general things that when you look at it, um, 
like, for example, you can say, oh, there's less set of races here than in the state, but ask the person whose son got shot by the cops. So I think we should um, be conscious of that, that uh, racism is insidious and it affects individuals as well as that it's systematic, so that when it drops on somebody, um, it, it, the quality is the same. It's a hundred percent. I, you know, greatly in terms of the culture, um, has gotten more diverse. I don't know if that's what you say, but anyway, and, and people, especially young people, um, people I teach, I can teach at the for 20 years, are more at ease with diversity. What they don't understand is the roots of uh, racism. When I talk to them about racism, I teach them what they're upset. They haven't heard about it. And they, you know, um, and I think that's deliberate uh, in terms of hiding that from uh, our children growing up in school. So, um, I don't know if I would go as far as to say it's better. I think we see more, and in fact, there, there's more flexibility and more mobility in connecting. I don't know if we did it in terms of percentage-wise, so the mathematicians among us, if, you know, it, there's a big difference in it. Um, so, just because racism is so um, persistent and um, that even at the highest levels, I still experience it, and everybody I know. Um, but I would hold any kind of pronouncement. And that, that's my opinion. I would just want to add uh, just the, the question uh, what is better? And so. Um, I think the line is better. Yeah. 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 My, my mother had to go to four funerals of her children. I didn't have to go to any. And that's the first generation of us that didn't have to go to any. I had 22 siblings, and then they didn't have dead kids. It's huge for us. There is an entire systemic racist attitude towards various minorities in this country. And I wanted to ask, um, like you've already asked, answer the question of how young writers are supposed to attempt this policy of achieving truth for communities today. But if racism is so inherent and systemic, even at higher education, um, is there any way to really present the truth? without having to conform to the dominant way of thinking about racism. It's on the unmessage. It's brilliant. <laughs> and so difficult. Uh, I have worked, I tell you, I don't think Lillian has to, I have worked to speak and hear store my stories in English the way I feel. I want those words to have the same effect on me as when I hear them in my language. And I've had to change a lot of how I use English to do that. And uh, I finally read a review by a man in Vancouver and he understood what I was doing with Celia's song. And I've been writing since, you know, I was nine, I guess. Um, and it was so good for me um, to read a review where he actually understood what I was doing from my home area. And it really only took 40 years. I mean, it, it, that's, I think that's amazing. I really do. So, 
I'm glad that I persisted and pursued to wrestle with this language as much as I did to be able to articulate story in it in a way that makes me feel whole in a foreign language. I think that's a difficult thing to feel whole in another person's language. It only took 40, 60 years actually. I started when I was now, no, 50, 55 years. Um, and it's something of a miracle to come from where I come from to this language and its inherent Boolean techniques of words and, you know, structures and whatnot, and to transform it enough to be a communal being in it. And I think that's amazing. And when I see uh, other people of color bring their selves to their stories and to their to their poems, I am wholly relieved. I am wholly relieved because it feels like the facade of the dominant culture is cracking and fracturing, and that's helpful to me when we articulate ourselves in this other language and transform it in the process. Just how to um, express the case for, for your own group uh, in your community or for yourself as an individual as a person who is a minority without having to conform to the dominant views of those. Oh, okay. Right. So, I would first of all say, um, in terms of truth, I would, I, I recommend a highly subjective perspective. Highly unapologetic, highly aggressively perceived subjective perspective. In your writing, and not as a That's my recommendation. Uh, to me, that's what makes the writing. Okay? Just be stand behind it. Um, well, for me, I just, um, and for the young people, that's why I support the, the movement uh, to uh, hip hop people as one of the big defenders uh, in the feminist movement. Uh, and my argument was we haven't heard from that uh, population for 400 years. And now we're hearing from them, and we don't like what they're saying. Most of them, but you know, should they shut up and go back in the woodwork? Is that what we want? Um, so I think that um, there is really no formula. We have to find not just what is satisfying to us, but what we can communicate and think about what we want. Right? My work fits in a place sometimes, some, some part, it goes along a spectrum that it's bridging. Uh, you know, so it's not English, not Jamaican, or it, it's, a, it's a bridging thing. It's a kind of new language that brings Canadians, uh, all the Canadian culture into it, although this is part of Canadian culture too. So it's an ongoing negotiation, right? But, um, we just have to find a way to do it. And as I say, the way I did it, because I wanted to be part of a culture. I didn't want it to be just be read and then nobody could identify where I am or where I came from. I wanted to strengthen and enrich black culture. Right? So I made sure that I used the cadences, the nuances of the language. Um, you know, and in doing that, in certain idioms and so forth, it, by necessity, it must master some of the uh, English language because it's, it's the language with a lot of violence and colonization, which sounds fun too, right? So, um, and then, you know, for me, it's pleasure. So, it has to sound nice and sweet, and, you know, I have to love it, right? So, um, that's me. So, I'm not trying to reach a world. Although I must say, I have had a far reach, right? Um, 
I'm, I'm just trying to reach uh, you know, certain people I can touch and have them transform and connect and move on. Like a relay, right? Or is it not? I do you that? You do. Yeah, yeah. Waiting for a long time before I thought to get published. I never wrote to get published. Um, I wrote because I wanted to achieve something uh, with this language. I wanted to be able to see myself in it. Um, so you can't get away from your own voice. No writer can. You really can't. Otherwise, it's, I don't know, they call it contrite, or they have all kinds of nasty names for think, you know. <laughs> if you're really genuine and it's whirling around inside yourself and, and kind of speaking from your soul and your heart, then the words will change the language and they won't be mainstream. Eventually, there won't be a mainstream. Yeah. We'll be like this country, little rivers and streams, all joining at some point. <laughs>